Cradled in a cloud of fable, Tibet, the land of snows, was a place unknown to the world beyond its mountain walls for nearly a millennium. Exotic tales abounded of this unearthly people on the vast plateau embraced by the Himalayan mountains, but it was not a land to be entered abruptly by outsiders. Inaccessible and remote, Tibet remained a mysterious figment in Western imagination. When the first expeditions of Westerners entered the Forbidden Land in the late 19th century, they brought back the first images the outside world had ever seen. They were images that provoked the fantastic tales even more. It seemed Westerners wanted to believe in the mythical Shangri-La, a temperate Asian land sheltered from the outside, governed by a philosophy of compassion and non-violence, free from hardship or strife. If similar in philosophy, the physical reality of Tibet was far more complex. Life on Earth's highest plateau was one of harsh contrast, a place where natural riches were matched by unimaginable rigors. Its first inhabitants were nomads who slowly adapted to high altitude extremities. Even for these rugged people, at 15,000 feet, their eyes could literally dry up from the brittle intensity of the sun. A sudden hailstorm could destroy a season's work or scatter herds in seconds. Their early history was marked by fierce wars among tribes and outsiders. Life expectancy was brief. They were a people with an acute sense of life's impermanence and suffering. It is not hard to understand why the Tibetans, whose outward conditions were so severe and changeable, came to look inward for a sense of permanence and peace. The king who had finally united them as a people wished to unite them in faith as well. He invited a charismatic leader from India, Padmasambhava, to bring Buddhism to his land. Tibetans had believed in a host of deities, both benevolent and wrathful. Overcoming sabotage from the leaders of this religion, known as Bon, was the challenge. Padmasambhava succeeded by blending these beliefs with the teachings of the Dharma, or Buddhist scriptures. Instead of casting the deities out, he creatively recast them as guardians and symbols of the Buddha's teaching. The result was a unique Himalayan hybrid of Buddhism. The lavish rituals and imagery of their former faith remained on the exterior, but the teachings of Buddhism slowly claimed the minds of the Tibetans. They came to embrace the Buddhist view of life as a continual stream of death and reincarnation, a cycle in which human birth represents a precious opportunity to make the moral choices that will determine one's destiny in the next life. Reincarnation in a lower realm of existence, into another human life, or ultimately into nirvana, a state of freedom from the suffering of physical existence. The beliefs profoundly changed the Tibetans' sense of morality. The social system and aristocracy of their past remained, but the new beliefs infused that system with a new benevolence. Nonviolence and compassion toward one another and outsiders was the new standard. And the degree to which Tibetans integrated these beliefs into their everyday lives grew to be the signature of their culture. Accumulating merit and purging past negative actions to ensure a good rebirth became part of daily ritual. Pilgrimages to sacred places came to include thousands of prostrations, a symbolic laying down of individual ego. 
Prayers were inscribed on flags and strung in long lines to flutter over homes and temples, their message of hope for the liberation of all earthly beings to be carried on the wind across the world. Reciting prayers was accompanied by the constant spinning of prayer wheels, a symbol of goodwill and loving kindness spinning outward toward all beings. Life literally revolved around their beliefs. As a community, they sponsored monasteries for the study and practice of Buddhist teachings. These vast structures were homes for tens of thousands of monks and nuns, publishing centers for all Tibetan society, and libraries for ancient texts. Unlike the more ascetic forms of Buddhism, the Tibetan version embraced the arts and sciences as tools toward understanding the infinite. Drama, music, art, astronomy, philosophy, and medicine were all taught at the monasteries. At the height of Tibetan civilization, the monasteries numbered over 6,000, with one in every six Tibetans becoming part of monastic life. Study began in the earliest years. Earning the equivalent of a doctoral degree could demand 20 years or more. The monks became the keepers of knowledge for all Tibetan society. And the thread linking all generations was a tradition of discipleship. One elder teacher, or lama, passing the teachings on to monks who, in turn, themselves became lamas. The new Buddhist beliefs also produced the most fascinating of Tibetans, the yogis. Unlike the Hindu yogi performing contortions for the public, the achievements of the Tibetan yogi were achievements of the mind, unseen by others. The Tibetan yogi was a monk or layperson who, having studied the teachings of the Buddha as a scholar, wanted to actually experience their promise within his own mind a state of existence called enlightenment. For the aspiring yogi, attaining enlightenment meant gaining an earthly preview of the bliss of nirvana through intensive mental and physical exercises in remote caves or huts. Their goal was to rise above the suffering of samsara or physical life and discover the purest nature of consciousness. In their quest Meditation retreats could last for years. For centuries, Tibetans revered these yogis as the most mystical people in their society. They supported their pursuit of enlightenment by providing the monasteries with food, clothing, and currency. The yogis inspired Tibetans with the hope that freedom from the suffering of physical life might indeed be attainable. Over the course of centuries, spiritual and state leadership converged. Tibetans began a tradition of identifying those among them believed to be reincarnations of the Buddha of Compassion. Among them, one would be named Dalai Lama, literally ocean teacher, implying depth and breadth of wisdom. Eventually, the one identified as the reincarnation of His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, would take his place as temporal leader of Tibet. The symbolic seat of this mystical government became the Potala, a majestic monastery looming over the legendary capital city of Lhasa. Well into the 20th century, Tibetans remained virtually untouched by the modern world. The threatening thunder of a human storm grew louder in Tibet as the 20th century progressed. The communist revolution swept China, and with it came a surge of interest in controlling the land of Tibet. Invoking past diplomatic ties between Tibet and imperial China's various monarchies, Mao Zedong used these as a thin pretext for claiming Tibet's strategic location, rich geologic resources, and the headwaters of key Asian rivers. 
In 1949, he announced that Tibet would be returned to the motherland, vowing to fill the region with 60 million Chinese within 10 years. Under the guise of liberating the Tibetans from an archaic way of life, the army of the People's Republic began invading villages and monasteries. The tensions of their initial occupation and opposition to religion grew into an increasingly brutal campaign to replace Tibetan practices and people with their own. The world had not yet absorbed the shock of Hitler's Holocaust when a new one had ignited in Tibet. The degree of the destruction is difficult to comprehend or communicate. As the invasion swept across their country, Tibetans who proclaimed allegiance to the Dalai Lama were imprisoned, tortured, or killed, often in exceedingly gruesome ways. Over a million Tibetans lost their lives, a fifth of the population. All but a few of the 6,000 monasteries were destroyed, bonfires made of their libraries, mockery made of their artwork and icons. The Dalai Lama, through all this, was Tenzin Gyatso, identified as a boy on a Tibetan farm. Remarkably, he was able to complete his rigorous studies despite the invasion, and Tibetans placed him in charge as a young teen, hoping he could reclaim their country. After his many attempts to negotiate with the Chinese, Tibetans feared their beloved leader would soon be kidnapped and killed. In a dramatic escape, the Dalai Lama was taken out of Tibet under disguise across the mountains to India, where he was given refuge and established a government in exile in Dharamsala. Chinese cruelty escalated in the years following the escape of the Dalai Lama prompting a flood of Tibetans following His Holiness to India for refuge. Among them were a number of their revered yogis. After decades, the memory of that dark passage remains vivid. After His Holiness the Dalai Lama departed for India, then the class struggle and purge started and all those who had name, fame, or prosperity were purged. They were beaten up, their hair plucked, their ears chopped off. And I thought to myself, when we talk in terms of hell, this must be the real hell. Then those who did not have either name, fame, or prosperity, they were rationed a certain amount of land. Then a couple of years down the road, the Chinese would turn around and say, where did you get all these? You must be part of the class system. There was a lot of pain and suffering. I was in Chinese prison for nearly 20 years. In the prison, instead of going to sleep, I would make a conscious effort to sit up and meditate. On Sundays, it was mandatory for everyone to sleep and keep quiet and I would pretend that I was sleeping, but in my mind I would meditate and quietly recite the mantras. When I left my homeland, there were about 3,000 in my group. When we reached India, there were only about 500 left. Many were killed on the way by the Chinese. Many died because of hardship in the journey, and many went back to Tibet. Many days we had to go without food, and also many people got hurt. If it had been under normal circumstances, the same trip would have taken three months. But because it was an escape during a war, it took two years. We had to defend ourselves against the Chinese nine times on the way. The fourth time, my father was caught by the Chinese.
In the decades since the invasion, Tibetans in exile have attempted to recreate their life as it once was. In the Indian Himalayas, there remain places sacred to Tibetans from long ago in their history that have taken on a new preciousness since the destruction of their homeland. They've also established new monasteries and schools in refugee communities throughout India. The government in exile remains in Dharamsala, working to help their people rebuild their lives. At the center of their hopes remains His Holiness, the 14th Dalai Lama. In the decades that have passed since fleeing the Chinese, he has accomplished what his predecessors would never have imagined. Worldwide recognition as one of the most extraordinary scholars, statesmen, and humanitarians of our time. Our nation, the people passing through very, very difficult situation, very difficult period. The period almost one ancient nation with unique and rich cultural heritage as well as spiritual heritage, now almost dying. I think, by uh, firstly, as a quite human nature, when someone, you see, uh, who have who who get all power, uh, then eventually power spoil or destroy one's own sort of good city, good quality. Then secondly, I think unfortunately, the totalitarian regimes, the communist sort of society or government system, is the, you see, dictatorship actually, I think, what say, legalized, isn't it? Uh, so once you see this certain sort of structure, you see, created that way, then, then uh, this, the system or the structure itself, you see, sometimes, I think, you see, uh, help, you see, to, to produce that kind of, you see, the person. Uh, now, I think the uh, democratic China, China with open society, uh, freedom of religious belief, freedom of speech, freedom of thought, freedom of information, I think that is the, uh, not only interest of the world community, but Chinese people themselves. But the destructive actions of the Chinese communist government have not been stopped after decades of diplomatic effort on the part of the Tibetans. And as they watch the flame of their culture slowly being extinguished in their native land, the tradition of the yogis is also being extinguished. Despite the presence of monasteries and monks in exile, the complete cultural environment that produced the mind masters of the past no longer exists. Without the unbroken lineages of yoga teaching yogi, without the vast stretches of time to spend years in isolated retreat free from earthly distractions, and mostly without the devoted support of the ancient Tibetan civilization, the tradition of the yogis is nearing extinction. Once the most reclusive people in the world, they are coming forward now with unprecedented candor to preserve their legacy of 1,000 years. Living out their lives amongst us are the last of the master yogis of Tibet. grasp the loss at stake with the loss of the master yogis, it is vital to understand what they have contributed to human development during their unique history. While the most advanced thinkers in the West developed the physical sciences to improve the outward state of humanity, the yogis developed a science of the mind to improve the inward state of humanity. Improving the emotional and moral response of the mind was their lofty goal, 
to transform patterns of thinking and alter patterns of acting by conquering anger, aggression, greed, pride, jealousy, even subdue states of physical discomfort. The techniques they develop to achieve these results are only now being recognized and affirmed by Western study of the brain and body. Central to the tradition of the yogis is the passing down of extensive teachings and highly guarded practices for training both body and mind. Within each order of monks, the detailed lineages of yogis, their students, and their techniques are recorded with great care. Each lineage bears a unique name and approach. With roots stretching back to Tibet's first master yogi, Naropa, the Drikung Kagyu lineage has long been renowned for producing highly advanced yogis. The Drikung Kagyu lineage has been running continuously without any kind of breakage in between or any kind of adulteration. That is starting from the founder of the lineage right down to this present day. When we look back in retrospect, there were so many highly regarded, highly realized yogis. The blessings are passed from one master to the other, right down to this present day. That is our specialty. I think back to Shana, how to say, you benefit your mind. The academic is just knowledge. Maybe you become a teacher, you teach in the terms, and this, this is one thing. But the practitioner, you have received you some blessings. And you, if you don't have this blessing in this lineage, you cannot have certain power to help benefit other people. And also, someone who not go to the academic school, but his practice, he certainly opened his wisdom. And he also know other people, how they need to benefit, he will know. What is it then that defines a yogi? How do they differ from the ordinary monk? Outwardly, few clues are to be found. The most lucid answers to the question come from those who have walked the path themselves. A yogi is a person who has a profound experiential understanding of the true nature of all phenomena. A yogini is a practitioner who does extensive retreats and one who has gained experiential understanding of the teachings. So it would have to be someone who has not only received ordination, but someone who has done extensive retreats. A yogi means one who enters into the Dharma or Buddhist teachings, and after that one who does the practice, which is about the mind, training the mind to be always at ease, always at peace. That is the definition of a yogi. Dharma lives within the yogi. Yogi follow the Dharma. If you really live on the Dharma, nothing can harm you. Even though they can be taken this life, but they cannot take next life. What a yogi or yogini strives to do is to put an end to the suffering that exists in cyclic existence. In order to do that, a yogi or yogini has to train his or her mind. Simply stated, a yogi or yogini will strive to counter all the negative emotions and try to generate positive energy. Experienced, qualified retreat person, even he remained in a, uh, what's it, a uh, street, street, a lot of noises, a lot of people, a lot of cars there, but his mind can remain fully concentrated. Uh. If someone is who have not that qual that that qualified, like I think myself, even remain in a remote area, try to meditate, my mind go everywhere. <laughs> Keeping the mind from going everywhere is precisely the challenge in meditation. 
and for centuries, aspiring yogis have retreated to remote places to avoid distraction while training their minds. Imagining life removed from society for years at a time can be difficult for Westerners accustomed to a world of virtually non-stop interaction. The question of where is another challenge. For Tibetans in exile, such places still exist in the Indian Himalayas beyond the reach of the Chinese. One of the 24 sacred places in Tibetan Buddhism is Lapchi, a meditation place, a Milarepa, one of Tibet's first yogis revered for abandoning a criminal lifestyle and attaining enlightenment within a single lifetime. A monk hiked for six days with a heavy camera into the mountains to bring back a glimpse of this primitive retreat. Even now, the images he recorded were permitted with reluctance. If the notion of pursuing enlightenment seems vague or inscrutable, the path of the yogi is in fact quite specific. The techniques and practices developed over a millennium are revealed to them in a rigorous order and only by an accomplished practitioner. Their beginning premise is that the untrained mind is like a raging elephant out of control. The yogi's initial task is to slowly put reins on the leaping, erratic thoughts of the mind by using specific tools, the repetition of core beliefs in mantras, and exercises to empty the mind of conceptual thought. Two yogis in retreat in Lapshi agreed to an interview, an unheard of opportunity. <laughs> You have come to Lapchi when I have taken a few days break in my retreat. This is an auspicious coincidence and something like this can only happen because of past connections and aspirational prayers. Milarepa went on a very long retreat in Lapchi and reached enlightenment through the practice of Tumo. He left several footprints on the rocks of Lapchi which attract many pilgrims. The disciples of many important masters have meditated at caves in Lapchi and the surrounding places. I am here on a retreat with permission from His Holiness Chetsan Rinpoche. After many years' retreat, I came to the conclusion that a human being's physical constitution in particular was a big impediment for serious practitioners. I came to realize that the only way to remove these impediments was to attain mastery over the five elements so that my practice did not have to be dependent upon sustenance and health. I read Milarepa's life history. It completely ravished away my mind. I strongly aspired to master the six yogas of Naropa, as well as the secret Prana, Nadi and Bindu, the three main components that are important in the practice of yoga. At any cost, I was determined to train myself to be able to master Tumo or Chandali. To do this, I found that Dharamsala was not conducive to the attainment of my aspirations. I needed a teacher who could pour down in me his experiential knowledge of such practices. I wanted the result of my efforts to create and leave an indelible imprint on my mind stream that I can forever carry forward. The most difficult thing to do is remain in single-pointed concentration. 
Bodily efforts, like doing hundreds of thousands of prostrations, and the efforts of speech, like recitation of mantras, are no problem. Controlling the mind is. I started my retreat when I was nine years old. During that time, I went on a one-month-long retreat. At first, it was very difficult for me. You know, I was a little boy. I would count the days on my fingers, say one day is gone, two days gone, how many balance remaining? Should I go out of the retreat place? If I do, what would be the consequences? These kind of questions keep on popping up. And then, although verbally you are reciting the mantra, but your mind is really, really busy on trying to get out of the retreat place. But when you become more seasoned and more mature in your meditation and learning, things will change. Well, what I like about the retreat is when you go to retreat and many weeks or many months being alone is very different. It will all subside our desire, anger, attachment. At the age of 17, I entered monastery. Now from that day onwards to this day, I worked for the monastery for two years. Aside from that, I have devoted all my times ever since the age of 17 on retreats and meditation. There's no such thing as sleep when we are in a retreat. And there is a particular box made and we sit cross-legged in there. And we sit in that position whether it is day or night. We can break up our practice into four slots of time. And during that time we may rest, but we will not get out of the box. We will continue sitting in that position all the time. Whoever wants to go on a retreat, whether that person is nun, monk or lay person, all are welcome. The dispensation of Dharma teaching is like the sun's rays. It is for everyone to enjoy. The job of a retreat master is to guide all of those who are on retreat, giving commentary on the teachings relating to the particular retreat that one is on how many sessions a retreat person has to do in the course of a day, what kind of visualization, what method of meditation, how one should do the mantra recitation, what are the graduated paths to this particular practice. So these are the kinds of things a retreat master will guide those who are on retreat. Once you come out of the retreat after three years, three months, three weeks and three days, you are a different person. If one is a different person after three years in retreat, the effect is exponential for those who have devoted decades to retreat. Indeed, the most profound evidence of the mind-altering effects of prolonged retreat are to be found in the oldest practitioners. Yet many of these elders have been imprisoned or killed in the half-century of Chinese occupation. Perhaps the oldest living Tibetan yogi is Druong Rinpoche, possibly the most revered yogi alive today. Here, for the first time, he grants a filmed interview, a rare glimpse into the mind of a meditation master. <laughs> Now, I have meditated for a very, very long time. It is very difficult for me to exactly reflect back and count the years that I had meditated. The reason for this is because although I do appear like a human person outwardly, my mental state is so different, different in the sense that my focus on mundane things is not consistent. When one meditates from the very day when one decides to go on solitary retreat, one has made a 
conscious decision to endure all kinds of losses, good clothing, good food, name, fame and prestige, all these things one must be ready to forego and give up. We are rationed the barest minimum amount of water and roasted barley flour for our sustenance, so that we may be able to sit in a meditation posture. Only once in a week we would have the smallest possible amount of food for our sustenance. You have to persistently make a consistent effort and undergo all kinds of hardship. Without undergoing hardship, one would not be able to experience the mental state of all the glorious past masters. When I meditate, I can see all my former lives. I have been born in the realm of hell. I have been born as a hungry ghost. I have been born many times as animals. All these things become very, very clear when one is in meditation. I have gone through the three lower realms of existence many times. In my meditative absorption, I always go through the pardo or intermediate gap, which is to say, between death and rebirth. But there isn't a great deal of point going into this. When one understands this life and the life after as one, to such a person there is no need to go into these nitty-gritty things. When one's body is already dismantled in one's meditation, there's no question of death or discarding one's physical body. The disciplined mind, then, becomes a powerful tool in its own right, enabling the practitioner to become aware of the subtle energies of the body, then master them through the breathing and physical postures known as yogas. Modern Western medicine has documented the mental powers of these meditation masters. One such practice, Tumo, was developed for generating body heat in the icy caves of Tibet. Yogis who have mastered Tumo are capable of immersing themselves in icy lakes and, 15 minutes later, producing visible steam rising from their robes. Tumo is a teaching that is strict and not one that is freely dispensed to whoever wishes to receive it. However, our environment and the time are very different now. So, backed by loving kindness and compassion, I am now showing it. And to me, it's not a violation of our yogic vows. Tomo is a practice that will bring about bliss and happiness, psychological as well as physical. The visualization is a lot simpler when you visualize yourself as a fully blown up balloon that is hollow, then you visualize a little object inside you glowing and generating heat. It is a very useful tool to help oneself and heal oneself. Other yogas were designed to benefit bodily health and to improve the length and quality of one's precious lifetime. While many basic yogas have been taught in the West for years, many of the more difficult and exotic yogas have been kept secret to preserve their purity. One such practice, Trul Core, was developed for opening the wind channels of the body, the pathways of energy associated with breathing. Through the practice of Trul Core, the yogi is able to improve breathing functions, help the body release toxins, and clear the mind. The filming of this demanding practice was permitted with great reluctance. In order to learn this thoroughly, it takes at least two years. But then you cannot leave it at that. You must do the practice all the time. Unless I'm traveling, I do the exercise two hours every day. And now I have one request. This is a very secret practice, so I must ask you to advise the viewer to not try to imitate me. If they do, there is a danger for their health and well-being. Because this is so secret, 
we must learn it from a particular teacher who can give the teaching from the beginning to the end thoroughly. The yogi who has spent years practicing and has gained a high degree of mastery over both mind and body is said to have achieved a high level of attainment to have become a highly realized being. Their powers are sometimes said to extend into the realm of the paranormal. Such supernatural stories have swirled around the Tibetan yogis throughout their history 
thickening the cloud of mystery surrounding them. Tales of telepathic communication and mind-controlling matter are reported among advanced practitioners to this day. The highly realized yogis can of course alter situations. There are many instances where the highly realized beings altered natural disasters. One example is where Chinese soldiers came to cause harm to a monastery or its inhabitants. All of a sudden, the change of weather, extreme poor visibility, the falling of hail, making it absolutely impossible for these people to come to their destination. There are so many different instances, far too many to narrate. There is a most wonderful and sacred meditation cave where it is said Guru Padma Sambhava meditated. I went there when I was only a boy, but I had a tremendous amount of devotion. When looking across the cave, I really felt like saying some prayers. I offered three prostrations and said, please show me some sign so that my devotions will further become stronger. And instantly there appeared a rainbow at the mouth of the meditation cave. And there I saw Guru Pema Sambhava. So I was just overwhelmed and really so very happy and all my focus was on the mouth of the cave and Guru Pama Sambhava. There were a lot of nuns with me, and one of them said to me, Rinpoche, Rinpoche, watch your foot. It is sinking in the stone. And I had to look, and there was my foot, making an imprint in solid rock, because it was really, just as the nun said, it was sinking. At the age of three, I was able to tell my previous lives. I was able to name my former sister. But now suppose I told you that I can remember all my former lives. Is anyone going to believe me? Therefore, just let's say that I was able to remember when I was a little boy. Such paranormal powers among master yogis are thought to include the ability to self-govern the process of transition from one life to the next. This is very often you can see in many good practitioners. Uh, the, most of the people die. After die, you can change your face, the yellow pear, you know. And, and uh, when you do the pinch in your skin, also they will stay there. But the real uh, practitioner who has met uh, when the passing, and uh, the meditation states, he really they do they continue their stay. Uh, then you pinch in here, this also like now, and they immediately going like this. And also they have a little bit of uh, heat and warm and heart center. Also the face is like a, uh, the lap light. And uh, very unusual one. And, happened that uh, my story is just uh, one year ago and Bhutan, Bhutan one of uh, master Ginjun Renjin. So he stayed more than one month, uh, one month and they never changed. For aspiring yogis, events such as these imply control over the process of reincarnation. Even His Holiness the Dalai Lama has stated that if the Chinese Communists are still governing Tibet at the time of his death, he will choose rebirth outside of Tibet. Controlling the process of one's own death and rebirth is the subject of some of the most fascinating stories surrounding Tibet's yogis. Lama Drupon Semten recalls vividly one such event in his early years as a student, the death of his own teacher, Kemgo Rinpoche. This is uh, my teacher, Kemgo Rinpoche. He invited all the students. He told he's going to pass away. No illness, nothing, nothing sign of death, nothing. He just normally get up, do his prayer, and he told his uh, attendant to make a good tea. And then he make a tea over and over and until he's satisfied. And he says, all this prayer together. And uh, when I get to the 
the completion state. He says, this is, is the time for me to pass away. And just like, just like a falling asleep, like a Buddha, you know, just he, he put his uh, right hand under his cheese and then lie down and look at the, each person. You know, he's doing prayer for each person to benefit in the future. Then he passed away. Telling stories such as these, indeed revealing any technique, tradition or experience to someone who has not completed yogic training, was once a violation of yogic vows to extreme secrecy. The reason was to maintain the purity of the teachings. The fear was that, taken out of context, exotic forms of yoga and meditation might degenerate into ego-centered showmanship. And in the eyes of the elders, the opening up that is taking place now is seen as a significant risk. When His Eminence Druong Rinpoche was asked about the cutting of his hair, a practice known to signify that a yogi is preparing to die, he displayed the stubborn elusiveness of a yogi under strict vow. <laughs> There are many reasons why a person in retreat would grow hair. Let me think about it. Yeah, there are many reasons why one would grow one's hair long. Let's just forget about it, shall we? A good number of things happened to me. It will just boil down to misleading people. Forget it. You know, I just cut it because I am old and the hair was really hefty and weighing me down. That's why I chopped it off. I have pledged not to mislead people. Now, if I told you a whole lot of tall tales, that will amount to misleading the audience. I have absolutely nothing whatsoever and I have nothing to tell you. This is the first time I have been asked to tell about these things. We are not supposed to reveal the ins and outs of what goes on inside a meditation cave. If we do, then there will be consequences. The past masters, including Tilopa, have categorically said there was never an instance where he revealed the secrets of meditation. We who follow in their footsteps must do the same. Although it is known that Zhuang Rinpoche did cut his hair in preparation for death, His Holiness the Dalai Lama asked him to live a little longer to help pass on and preserve Tibetan teachings. It is said that His Eminence agreed to do so and has decided to live until the age of 100 to help his people. Beyond feats of mental, physical, or even supernatural control, perhaps the most impressive accomplishment of the Tibetan yogis is maintaining a stance of compassion and peace through a half century of persecution. The teachings of loving your enemies and praying for those who persecute you are familiar in the West, but are, few would argue, among the hardest to practice. Skeptics may well point out that feelings of love and peace may be easily generated when you are by yourself in a cave, but not when you're coping with the human conflict inherent in real life. Yet, the claims of the Tibetan yogis have been put to the extreme test in the Chinese Holocaust. How does one retain compassion in the face of raw cruelty? Some use the ancient uh, uh, the text uh, stated or says, the one's own enemy is the best teacher. Now, one example. So one old monk who in previously uh, the Namjil Monastery, one monk of the Namjil Monastery. Now he spent almost uh, 18 years in Chinese in Gulag, after 59. So uh, after uh, he released from the camp, eventually he joined with me here. So then one day I casually asked about his experience in the, in the Gulag. Then he told me, a few occasions he faced some danger. And I asked, what, what kind of danger? 
I thought danger of his life or something like that. Then he answered me, danger of losing compassion towards Chinese. So, that's, we, we, as a practitioner, we deliberately we should try to keep compassionate uh, attitude towards one's own enemy is very essential. I don't blame the people of China. I blame their policy or their culture because it's a communist culture. The culture is at fault, not the people. In the ways of what we call samsaric beings, in the ways of the ordinary people, lay people, if I followed that, yes, obviously, yes, there would be sadness in my heart. And there were a lot of sufferings that were brought about to a lot of people and to myself. But as a practitioner who believes in the cause and effect, I'm a very, very happy person. I have no grudge against anybody. I have no grudge against the Chinese people or the Chinese government. Whatever befell on an individual, it was because of his past karma. Unhappiness does not crop up out of nowhere. It is a result of one's commission of negative karma in former lives. For example, when you cheated others, when you try to defeat others, when you try to gain at the cost of others, these result in what we call the ripening of karma that brings about pain and suffering. So when you do negative deeds, the result is a state of mind that is often referred to as hell. When you have done positive deeds, it brings about happiness. I was born after the Chinese operation in Tibet. I am upset with them and I am sad because the Chinese have been very ruthless to Tibetan people and my family. You name it, they have done it. At the same time, they have destroyed so many monasteries in Tibet. Maybe it is because I am still young and my practice is not strong enough yet. Maybe this is why I am upset with the Chinese. As an antidote to conquering very strong negative emotions, we would resort to doing the sevenfold Verochana posture meditation. There are different wind energies inside a human person. In one posture, the wind which enables us to excrete waste enters into the central nerve channel, eliminating some of the negative emotions. When you broaden your shoulders and sit upright, the nerve or vein-related winds enter and get rid of ignorance. When your neck is slightly bent downwards at an angle, and you touch the tip of your tongue on the palate, then fire-related wind enters and dissipate desire. When you lower your eye a bit so you almost see the tip of your nose, the space-related wind enters and gets rid of egocentric pride. When you sit cross-legged and remain in single-pointed concentration, then water-related wind enters and helps get rid of jealousy. These postures are a very good method of getting rid of some of the negative emotions. Are newer generations of Tibetans raised exclusively in exile, immersed in contemporary culture, displaying the discipline and compassion of their elders, Evidence of cultural erosion is appearing among younger Tibetans in exile. Demonstrations and violent protests are becoming increasingly common in refugee towns. Some are beginning to question the pacifist approach of their leader. Even so, the spirit of their native culture remains strong, and some still aspire to the example of past masters. In our life, we do many different things, we are in different professions, but we all have a single goal, and that is to be happy. And the only way to be happy is, is to believe in one's own mind that it can be happy, that it has happiness all the time. And that is very important to know, that is very important to notice. 
If we fail to notice that, then we start to expect external materials to make us happy. In our life, we change different things in the hope of being happy. We change our name, we change our dress, we change our food, we change everything. But we realize every time that this change has never brought the true happiness. So the only way to stop all this game is realizing the nature of mind, which is a Buddha and which is content and fulfilled and satisfied from the beginning. So although I still have desire, I still lack uh, uh, all the material things, deep down in my heart I often feel that this is not the real way of happiness. Yet even the most earnest efforts of these young practitioners cannot maintain the tradition of the yogis as it once was. The number of authentic elders dwindles daily. The best the younger generation can do is preserve the practices of their ancestors, the shadows of a total lifestyle that will never again be possible. This observation by His Holiness the 14th Dalai Lama points to the irony of the Chinese Holocaust. Intent on destroying Tibetan culture, the Chinese have in fact successfully driven it out into the world. It is seen in a phenomenon that began shortly after the invasion and continues today. Once the most reclusive people in the world, the master yogis of Tibet have begun to migrate westward. As hope of reclaiming their native land fades, they are relocating to establish temples and teaching centers. Now the Buddhism is developed in the West, so we have uh, centers from South America, from Chile to North America, to Canada, and we also have uh, uh, Baltic countries, uh, two in Central Asia, we have maybe 40 centers more than so we have to also properly guide the Buddha's teaching. It is in one way, you know, a very difficult situation in Tibet today, and it's been that way for many years. But from that, we have so many wonderful teachers and examples that have come to the United States, Europe, and different countries to make Buddhism available to us. One day His Holiness the Dalai Lama called me down and said, well, this is time now. It is time for you to actually come out of retreat. And now your time has come to benefit all beings. Listening to that advice, I ended my retreat. And from that day onwards to this day, I have visited so many countries and I have taught so many countless number of people and it was absolutely as His Holiness said, I benefited so many people and I keep on going strong. Now, since I came to the United States, it has gone five years. The job of all Dhamma practitioners is to help other beings. In countries like India and Nepal, there are many lamas and teachings are readily available to the population. And this case does not apply in the United States and other Western countries. The main point of the teachings is the generation of loving kindness and compassion. And I hope to help people in the United States and teach them loving kindness and compassion. Arizona has become home to one such center a growing facility where Tibetan yogi Garchen Rinpoche guides the teachings. Now, where the adobe dwellings of Native Americans once stood, clusters of retreat huts, temples, and teaching rooms hug the rugged terrain of the Chino Valley. In them gather people from all walks of Western life, from many faith traditions, 
there to learn what wisdom this ancient people might have for a weary modern society. Well, I think the, the, the general society now has um, so many influences which are rather superficial in nature. And uh, even though we uh, theoretically have a lot of uh, extra time, uh, more and more I think people are finding that the different distractions and things that they do are not particularly meaningful to them. And so they're searching for something else uh, to give their life meaning. Here we saw that all the technology, we see that all the rich people, we have all the money, we, we can, whatever you want, the food, Chinese, all these different, you can get. But then people find out that having material, having technology is really not answer your inner question and not fulfill ultimate goal. And therefore, they have some, this kind of spirituality. I would say human society, the, that's love and compassion is the only way to bring peace and happiness. Garshan Rinpoche teaches patience a lot, like your worst enemies are your greatest teachers because they teach you patience. They teach you definite patience. And during school and when I'm at home, like I have a two-year-old little next door neighbor and he just gets on my nerves all the time. And so it's like, it gives me a lot of patience to practice. If I have a bad day, it makes me um, think about my bad day, reflect on my bad day. And there's a part that you should do every night like you think of two things that you did bad in that day and try to fix them the next day and then you think of two things that you did good that day and you try to do them the next day as well i think it's very bad it's very sad that we're losing yogis and we're losing someone who can connect us with our own enlightened nature and from other point those realized masters that comes here and comes to other countries can teach other people and it was not possible before and even there are so many people who even would not think about buddhism until they would meet realized master just looking at our lamas that we have like his holiness the dalai lama and many wonderful western lamas um, when you look at them, you, you get some true feeling that, that they really have some kind of inner peace. And if we could receive those teachings from, uh, from the yogis and put them into practice in our own lives, that is the way to save. Um, that is the only way to save um, the lineage of the Tibetan yogis. Um, and that's the most important thing to, um, to do, I think. The Lamas who have come to the West are still adapting to the pathways and parameters of this new life. And their questions remain. Will the filming and sharing of techniques lead to abuses? Will self-styled lamas and bogus practitioners exploit Western interest in Tibetan Buddhism and mislead people? Is the form of their faith destined to dissolve in the ways of the West? The devotees of the Dharma hold that even if the tradition of the yogis and other outward expressions of Tibetan Buddhism die out completely, the teachings of the Buddha will survive. Because of the Chinese occupation, it is extremely difficult to have the same amount of yogis coming either inside Tibet or outside. The number of yogis has definitely decreased and it is difficult to see whether we will have the same amount in the future. According to the things that have taken place in Tibet and according to the prevailing circumstances, it would seem that the tradition of the yogis will come to an end. If not come to an end, it will near extinction.
However, we are very confident that whenever there is a dip in the progress of the Buddha's teachings, there will be a proportionate recovery. So in that respect, I have faith that we will recover from it. Will Tibetan Buddhism thrive in its new soil? Can people who do not experience the daily hardships of the native Tibetans, Westerners who lived enveloped in material comfort, ever fully embrace a philosophy based on escaping earthly suffering? Or has material success left a big enough void of its own to drive the Western mind inward for solace? Even for those who seek to follow the example of the Tibetan elders, the human environment is drastically different. They are striving to train their minds, sustain intensive meditation, and maintain a disciplined compassion for their fellow humans, not in sheltered enclaves, but while living and working in the frenetic grip of a 24-hour society. Can any philosophy of compassion and non-violence be successfully practiced in the crucible of modern life? For now, the answers to these questions remain as mysterious as the minds of the master yogis themselves, living remnants of an ancient and vanishing civilization, human artifacts from the Tibet that once was.